in our second talk now, we're going to look more at what we understand about what brains do. And um, for that, we have a uh, Cyril Pennard, and Cyril, uh, who is a return visitor to our to our summer school. Um, so, so Cyril has has an amazing track record in neuroscience, in particular the study of rodents. Even though now he's also farming out to humans, I understand, in some sense. Some, yeah. some years. <laughs> and but what what Cyril has been doing, which is really unique, is that. Um, he has been looking at how, how large samples of neurons across many different areas are involved in, in performing tasks, right? So it, that means we don't look at neurons in slices, we don't look at single neurons in single areas, but we're really starting to get the feeling of how regions in the brain code task variables and how these regions work together in the context of pretty complex tasks um, that, that rats are able to solve, so in going in the direction of, let's say, maze learning, foraging, or optimal decision making, right? So, it's uh, really wonderful that you're with us, so thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear it at the back? Is that okay? What did, what did you yeah. say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, thanks for uh, uh, your invitation. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm a return visitor, so I also uh, made some effort to uh, rejuvenate talks and not uh, and not uh, recrunch uh, older data. Um, so a lot of it is hopefully also new for uh, the people that were here before. And um, uh, like Paul said, um, the talk was also sec uh, set in the, our second week on adaptive goal-directed uh, robots in relation to the EU project that uh, uh, Giovanni Pazzullo is, is also leading here. Um, and this, the theme of my talk is, is especially on the biological constraints for, for robots. We're going to extract uh, general themes and problems that are both encountered in neuroscience as well as robotics, such as uh, communication between modules. So much of the data focus on, on how um, information is integrated in connected neural systems and how these uh, modules uh, communicate, uh, particularly in the sensory, memory and motivational uh, domains. And yeah, to illustrate these, these problems a little bit more, uh, I, I googled a little bit on, on robot architectures and came across deck-like uh, structures as of uh, uh, the group of uh, ah, Verschuren. Ah, brain works. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, but it's yeah, quite typical also in the work of Prescott or Petsudo and, and Chelsea. Uh, there's always modules uh, that, of course, have a functionality. And then comes up the problem of how you make the, the right modules talk to each other. So. Uh, it's, it's not very useful to have communication channels open all, the, all at the same time so that all the modules talk to all of each other, but you also have to have a control mechanisms that, that set a, a gain on the uh, communication. As well, sometimes um, you have to code for events that are so uh, important, of overriding importance, that you might want to code them in multiple modules at the same time, even though there can be division of labor or specialization in particular modules, such as hippocampus and striatum. <clears throat> and that's going to be the theme. And then finally, um, how versatile is the coding in a, a signal structure, such as the hippocampus as a memory structure? Is it really mainly about place uh, or time or also what uh, information that is uh, uh, coding of multiple objects uh, being present in uh, the rat's world? Situations that might be a little bit comparable to Maryland's situation if um, we go back to 1520, he sealed up uh, the river of Rio de la Plata in Argentina and uh, thought he was maybe finding his way uh, westward to the Spice Islands, finding a shortcut to uh, what we call the, the Far East, but for his was west. And he, uh, well, he was actually barking up the wrong tree and, and not finding a continuation of the salty waters over there and eventually found his way south, of course, to the Strait of Magellan where the water stinks salty. We're trying to also uh, similarly in neuroscience and robotics probably to, to find this gradient of uh, continuous salty water and, and find the right entry of what is actually working in the brain and uh, probably the convergence of robotics and computational uh, neuroscience with uh, physiology and, and anatomy will, will get us over there, but it will be uh, an effort of a whole uh, fleet um, avoiding the word uh, flagship in this context. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the first um, uh, system we're going to look at is, is, is that of the uh, hippocampus uh, and striatum, especially ventral striatum. 
Uh, these are uh, structures long known to be involved in spatial memory as, as for the hippocampus, uh, but also episodic memory in general, of course. And it has been somewhat of an anomaly that the episodic or declarative memory system talks um, very much, is very much connected to uh, systems for procedural memory, systems that, uh, for instance, make animals react to cues or contexts and drive goal-directed behavior, such as a search for a reward. And here you see an, the anatomical gradient <coughs> of uh, prefrontal areas uh, projecting into corresponding regions of the uh, striatum, uh, with green being the uh, more lateral sensory motor parts of, uh, of the frontal cortex and um, the purple zones more medial. Uh, those are also the ones that are connected to limbic structures such as hippocampus and they, they converge on this accumbens or ventral striatal area with basal amygdaloid information uh, together with hippocampal information, mainly reaching the shell region of accumbens. Here you see a more detailed outline of the projections, where you also see how uh, pyrurhinal and enterhinal information, together with uh, amygdaloid information, basal lateral amygdala, enters into the uh, ventral striatal system. <clears throat> so it's a system where, where you see the convergence of uh, spatial episodic information from the hippocampus uh, together with amygdaloid information, presumably transmitting a lot of cue, uh, motivational cue information that could drive behavior, and together with prefrontal uh, inputs, uh, <coughs> especially from the prelimbic parts. This kind of architecture, uh, just as a side note, that we argued is um, not so suitable for actor-critic divisions, uh, relating also to Mark's talk uh, before. Um, what you more see in the stratum is a continuum of information presentation it all has to do with reward predictions or outcome predictions, uh, but based on different domains. So sometimes spatial information from the hippocampus can be useful to predict outcomes. Sometimes cue information like lights or um, um, particular visual stimuli or odors will predict uh, outcomes. Uh, also, yeah, basically action, action states can predict outcomes or sensory motor states can also predict actions as, as outcomes. Um, so that might fit into uh, uh, the idea that we're not dealing here with a strict actor-critic division, but more uh, of a continuum of uh, predictions that drive uh, motivated behaviors. Um, to show that uh, the hippocampus and ventral stratum are both involved in solving a particular problem, um, we collaborated with colleagues in uh, Cambridge, that is Barry Everett and Trevor Robinson, Rutsuko Ito, who um, devised this so-called Y-Maze task. Uh, first, the red is basically conditioned on my cue. It has to watch a light. And um, if the red is then placed in this uh, Y-Maze environment, uh, the cue will come on, and, and basically the red will be able to secure a reward at every appearance of the cue light. But later on, uh, there's a place preference installed. Now, uh, the cue light is only rewarding in one of the chambers, not in the others anymore. Uh, and then to really test that the animal has developed an independent preference for a chamber, one of these three, uh, the red will be put into this extinction situation without reward and without cues, but still will choose to spend most of his time in that previously uh, rewarded chamber. That's a more formal uh, psychological way to, uh, uh, to reinforce this idea that um, uh, there is a place preference development independent of cues and direct presence of reward. Um, and then uh, Rutsuko lesions the hippocampus together with the shell in this case contralaterally. So it's a disconnection lesion. Note that the uh, contralateral hippocampus is intact. If there would be cross connections to the other hemisphere, it could still talk to the, uh, the other intact accumbens, but uh, these um, uh, cross lateral connections are, are not, uh, not so much present. And indeed, this disconnection lesion gives a loss of uh, the place preference. This is the time spent in uh, each of these chambers. The paired one used to be paired with reward. Um, a sham lesion uh, does leave the place preference intact. A core lesion also, uh, presumably because the core with all its amygdaloid inputs is um, important for Q uh, outcome predictions, but not so much for context uh, outcome predictions. Whereas the uh, disconnection lesion and the shell lesions uh, do give an abolishment of, uh, of the place preference. <coughs> We um, uh, rebuilt this task in a, an electrophysiological setting. This is the work of uh, Karin Lansink um, in the lab. Uh, also three visually identical chambers, 
And here, the red also has to navigate around and pay attention to these queues appearing, queue lights, um, where they learn very much to generate correct responses, that is, approach to the queue light, get a reward over there. Later on, there's the contextual phase where, in this case, there's a high probability of reward in one chamber and low probability in other chambers. And this also gives um, rise to uh, a real place preference. So in the absence of reward, you find uh, a continued uh, preference for that uh, chamber. Um, but then we wanted to, to know at the coding of uh, both, both place parameters uh, as well as action-related reward prediction parameters. And so she made uh, simultaneous recordings in the hippocampus with tetrodes as well as in uh, the ventral striatum. Um, so both had bundles of tetrodes and uh, the kind of results you get are for the hippocampus actually more or less the classical place fields. Uh, that is, these are firing rate maps. These are all individual neurons. This is a, uh, each box is a neuron with here the maximal firing rate. And so the yellow part means a, a, a big uh, place field of that cell covering the middle triangle where the rat is when starting a trial, typically trying to find out where the queue is being presented. Um, and in addition, there are, there are these micro place fields, which are kind of interesting because they point to the fact that um, there's a higher resolution spatial coding at the most relevant sites, which are the nine reward sites. So each of these black dots represents a reward site where a lot of time is spent. So you do have distinct uh, small place fields at these reward sites. Is that for the pattern that others have observed as well? That, for instance, if you couple a location with reward, that the, the place fields start to shrink around that? Um, has been reported, but um, for instance, Holop from the Moser group reported a higher density of place fields okay. at uh, okay. relevant sites. Yeah. Um, I, th I think there's not much systematic documentation of shrinkage of place fields, but this is certainly uh, one of the studies that, um, that indicates that. Um, all right, so uh, apart from this distinction between macro place fields, sort of bigger compartments and smaller ones, uh, it's pretty much a classic hippocampal picture. And the uh, interesting uh, addition is that um, these patterns develop based on path integration. Because the chambers were visually identical, rats had no local cues, we even excluded odor, traces, etc. cetera. Um, so they basically had to remember where they came from and which chamber they would enter next. Um, this would differ from a situation where the, the chambers are all marked by different discrete cues or, uh, let's say, a computer buzzes, etc. So if you then look at the ventral stream, you, you, still, you do get a quite different pattern, actually, uh, also in terms of firing rate maps. So in a sense, there is a, a division of labor. The ventral stream does not inherit uh, place fields from the hippocampus, even though there's this strong projection. Uh, what you instead see are these more cauliflower-like patterns in this case where cells map onto uh, distinct uh, phases of the action that leads up to the reward. So there's a start point, the queue appears, the animal starts walking, and then some cells will cover the initial part of the track. So for instance, the, the entry into a chamber is being covered. Uh, and then the next part, let's say the continuation into the chamber or the arrival at reward sites like over here. So this is more a uh, staggering or a tessellation of the whole uh, action sequence that leads up to reward. And we think this is also very much coupled to uh, reward prediction. Uh, but note that the patterns are really symmetrical into all chambers. So because there's path integration here and no local queuing, uh, we think what happens is that uh, the hippocampus information gets in there, but is being used and integrated in the comments to generate uh, reward, reward predictions and let's say, uh, an instruction what to do next. Go into a chamber, but it can be either one of the three chambers. The action is the same. I mean, Would you also see a temporal uh, distinction? So like, for example, the third cell, would you see that it only fires when it goes in, or it is independent when it goes in and comes out? Yeah, that, that can be distinct, yeah. yeah uh, certainly at reward sites, there's a big distinction between approach and leaving the reward site again. So uh, yeah, a lot of cells actually shut down at the reward delivery. Uh, now it's a fluid delivery which involves licking, uh, but most common cells don't fire during that licking. Uh, it might be dorsal strain that, that does that. It's got a lot of orofacial behavior. Uh, but also leaving a reward site is uh, often not coupled to uh, distinct firing. Um, 
Uh, but in this sense, uh, in this y maze with behavior relying on path integration, you do find a division of labor between the hippocampus and the commons. The commons itself being much more coupled to, uh, to goal-directed actions and not but so much. Surreal, the, roughly, it appears that the, the distribution of uh, frequencies you find over these responses is, is somewhat broader than what you found in hippocampus. Is, is that in any way relevant or? The maximal rates. Yeah, yeah. Um, it might be relevant. Um, the, the whole stratum is actually known for its low firing rates, uh, at least basally. So a lot, a lot of cells are actually totally silent uh, unless suddenly the animal approaches a reward and you notice that you actually have a cell because uh, despite we're actually not seeing when searching for the cells by pushing down the tetrodes in the tissue. Um, and indeed in slices you see a very hyperpolarized resting membrane potential of around minus 80 something, minus 90 millivolts, which is close to the reverse potential of potassium. Anyway, it basically means that you need a lot of convergent excitation to make these cells fire. Uh, but this could happen based on a strong hippocampal input mm -hmm. or a convergence of hippocampal amygdaloid prefrontal inputs. Uh, but that seems elements. to make sense, right? Because it might even, you might even have a correlation here between the max frequency and the size of, of the response fields. Hmm. Have you looked into that? Uh, no, actually not, but that's, that's an interesting topic to pursue, yeah. But also these generalized cells which, exactly. which fire all over the place. Mm -hmm. This could also be interneurons, so we would actually have to look at the spike waveforms to say if they're fast spikers or uh, broad spikers. Um, okay, so yeah, that could be something to look into. Uh, but now we also go to the topic of integration, um, because you might be thinking that I want to suggest that what these structures do is totally different. Uh, but sometimes you find patterns of sort of events of overriding importance that might alter population states uh, more globally. Um, and that relates to the topic of uh, remapping. What you find over here is, is, a, is a clustering method that Jaden Jackson applied in the lab. Uh, the original observation actually comes from Andre Fenton, who in the hippocampus observed that if a rat crosses a, uh, a, a place field, so there's spatial selectivity in that cell, um, then uh, you do get an enhanced firing response. But if you compare many trials and many different approaches to that site, you noted that the variability of the spiking is actually greater than could be explained from a Poisson distribution, which suggests that there might be multiple states in the system, uh, despite the fact that there's one place field uh, defined. Uh, and Jaden uh, Jackson applied the following method. He said, well, okay, let's, let's take the firing rate of a neuron when the rat passes across that spatial bin um, and let's say that we, that happens at time zero, so we plot the firing rate here as a yellow bin. And then on the next pass, maybe a couple of seconds later, um, there's another firing rate being noted, maybe slightly lower, so a green bin. And so you do this for all the neurons that uh, you happen to record, let's say, in the hippocampus. Um, and then basically by, by a k-means clustering, you force uh, by the algorithm uh, a distinction in population states where you say, okay, I'm going to, to cluster these, these blue states where neuron 1 is high firing, neuron 2 is low firing, etc. together. I'm going to make two maps uh, corresponding to these two clustered uh, states. It could in fact be more states, if any. Uh, so now you get a, a clustering of the firing patterns where one neuron, for instance, in state 1 is always kind of low. That would be this blue one. In the other state, it would be uh, highly active. But you do this for all the cells together. Um, and then you also sort uh, these clustered firing patterns in terms of which bins are most closely correlated. Are the neighboring bins in the same state or not? That can be done and it results in, in your firing rate map being broken down in two submaps, um, which can be totally arbitrary. It's not guaranteed to yield any result because it might be just a randomization uh, effect that you find. Uh, but that's what we're going to, to look at, whether there's any um, sensible correlate of that. <clears throat> and the first question is, is actually if you define these state transitions in this way, these, these map switches as we call them, um, is there any uh, distinct structure in the neural firing or is it completely arbitrary what you find? Uh, and here um, we see how the state transition uh, in the hippocampal ensemble is indeed coupled to distinct structure changes in the hippocampal neurons. Here are all the individual hippocampal neurons, which are about 250. Um, and you see how 
before the state transition, there's, there's a lot of increases in firing rate, which might suddenly stop, and then there are other neurons which start out with a, a decrement, and then after the state transition, uh, show an increment in firing rate. And it's pretty much the same for the ventral striatum, actually. But these are independently defined, because they are purely defined by the statistics of neural firing in that structure. That's real. I don't want to be difficult, but for me it's not so obvious that, I mean, I, I do see that at point zero that there's sort of a burst of activity uh -huh. across your population, but really before and after, I, I don't see this as being so s dramatically different. So have you quantified this in some way, or is there some statistics behind this? Uh, yeah, you can do in, indeed shufflings and, and find um, um, that you, you won't find this, this type of structure uh, based on uh, shuffle data. Um, you do find some cells which don't link to the state transition. These are on the diagonals over here. Sure. Having, uh, they reach a peak in firing rate unrelated to uh, the state transition moment as defined by these statistics. Uh, but in fact, this, this clustering is, is, is not coincidental. It, it doesn't always say that the peak aligns exactly with the state transition. But this sometimes is a, is a dip in firing and then a resumption. Uh, but basically, yeah, you can, you can um, uh, what Jaden did is, is also to apply PCA clustering, etc., and define how different subpopulations uh, change in relation to this. So, as an above. Zero, zero is exactly what? Zero is the moment of state transition as defined by the clustering algorithm. No, but I mean so relative to the task the animal is performing, for instance. Ah, that's, that's the next uh, few slides. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah so the, the trick here is basically to purely depart from state transitions as intrinsic events defined by the statistics of the firing, uh, not um, having any assumptions about whether that would correlate with anything in the behavior or uh, cues or events that the animal experiences. Um, here we have um, a rendering of what the rate maps look like in the two different states. And basically here you have the hippocampus state one versus state two. These are example neurons. Again, in the Y maze, so for instance here, you, you would have a neuron that is not active in one state, but does show a clear place field in the other state. Uh, most of these cells uh, conform to uh, a scheme of rate remapping, that is, that there's some visibility of a place field in one state, but it gets stronger in the other state. Uh, but sometimes there's a very strong uh, gain effect or disappearance or appearance of, of a place field. In the ventral striatum, uh, usually mostly similar to that, state one and state two um, are seen to um, basically reflect similar firing preferences across the YMAs, but sometimes there's quite a strong shift as over here. Um, so it's, it's not purely a, um, uh, a rate modulation with um, complete spatial uh, invariance. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it can be really likened to rate remapping as it has been described by Lloyd Gabe, for instance, when he changed uh, wall cues, for instance, in an environment. But yet no uh, coupling yet to behavioral events or external events. Um, what you do see is that if the cue, uh, this, this cue light, if it switches on, uh, there's an enhanced probability of having a state transition. So here um, we're having a Z-score picture, and now at the zero moment over here, there's a cross correlogram of the Q change on or offset with uh, the probability of finding a state transition. Um, and with the CS offset, you have a bigger, greater chance of, of having a state transition than in the case of Q offset. Um, now th this could be this overriding important event. Uh, apparently it, it does affect coding in the hippocampus, even though you, know, you might think hippocampus mainly is concerned with pure spatial coding. But on top of this, there's this dynamic cue, which uh, apparently does something to these, these overall ensemble states. Um, in the ventral stratum, uh, similar picture again. Also here, the cue onsets uh, trigger this major motivational change. The animal now understands I have to go after this cue light and get my reward. Uh, there's a tail of, of higher rates of transitions afterwards. Uh, also at the cue offset, it's, it's a lower rate. So. The overall pattern is, is quite similar. Um, but now we, that we see that the hippocampus is, is also sensitive to motivational cues, and it's not just the amygdala or prefrontal cortex, uh, translating uh, cue information into uh, neural coding, 
uh, the question comes up, are these state transitions actually coordinated across these structures? But yeah. an alternative interpretation is to say, well, it's an attentional effect, right? There, yeah. The cue yeah. comes on, I have some salience, there's a yeah. very non-specific wave of, of activity going through the whole of the brain, and that's what you see here. So right, we, 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 don't, we don't distinguish here motivation from attention. To do this, you would have to do a different type of experiment. Um, I'm saying you, you cannot distinguish the two, it is possible. In principle, it would be possible, okay. yeah, but not here. The, the cue light comes on, it means basically reward prediction for the animal. It's the action instruction of I have to go there, which may be very well coupled with additional attentional processes. Like keep focused on this, Armin? And could it not just be just a behavioral effect? Because when the cue comes on, the rat will move differently, and the rat moving through the play cell differently will change the statistics how you sample of the play cell that you then detect in the clustering, and then you, while detecting the clustering, you exactly pick up the different behavior. Yeah. It's not like the brain has not the different states, and yeah. actually through different behavior, you have different activation in the brain that then links to this clustering. Yeah. Can yeah. you somehow control for all this possible, it could be all the possible changes that, that that's actually nothing to do with the substrate, but more with the behavior or the sampling of the, of the play cell. Yeah, uh, no, that's a very good question, good point also. Uh, but we do know, um, we, we video track the animal and we can compute the local locomotion speed. Um, if you do a stratified analysis on this, and for instance, you compare um, uh, approaches to goal sites under Q conditions versus non-Q conditions, which happens because the rat just likes to poke even if there's no Q, um, and, and the rat has similar locomotion speeds, you still find a higher rate switch in the Q condition. Um, also we find, and I'm not showing that here, but if the animal makes its entry into a box, um, then in the, in the Q case that gives rise to a higher uh, switch rate than in the non-Q case, uh, whereas the locomotion states are again similar. So I'm not excluding all behavioral variables. It's sort of impossible to measure whether the rat is also doing different whisking, etc. But the real but orienting movements you then don't control for, right? You look at position. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the orienting movements are particularly uh, strong uh, when the rat expects a cue to come on. So it, it will search for the location where it will be from this middle platform. Uh, once the rat is going, like it's going into a chamber, then it's, it's fairly stereotyped. Right, okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, these are always important uh, concerns to, to make sure. Yeah, yeah they're very concerned. Um, what is um, uh, surprising but also nice to see in terms of coordination is that uh, the hippocampal switches, even though they are computed independently from the ventral stradal switches, uh, are, are very much strongly correlated. So this is a cross correlogram from when the hippocampus switches at time zero, there's also a peak of ventral stradal switches. Um, and this is quite tight around zero. The time resolution to compute this is around 100 milliseconds. So it's hard to say which structure drives the other. This would be a matter of milliseconds. Do you have a face lag at all? Uh, it's, not, it's not visible <coughs> as, as far as we compute. We do need these time windows to, to have some kind of estimate. What would be an expected latency of this effect? Imagine the, the <coughs> hippocampus or the, the ventral stratum leads this effect, let's say. Imagine. Yeah? Could be. Yeah. What yeah. would be the yeah. expected latency? Because they're fairly close together. Uh, transduction latencies are of a certain magnitude, so what, what would be the expected latency you would, fa you would find? Uh, the projection is, is unidirectional, so it's mainly subiculum CA1 to Cummins, and physiologically the conduction delays are in the order of 25 milliseconds, Okay, maybe a bit shorter. So that should be the predicted phase lag in the yeah, cross-correlation? Yeah. But following the anatomy, it should be the hippocampus first, and then a Cummins. Sure, okay. It might be the other way around, because maybe there's first an amygdala transmission to stratum. Right. Uh, the ventral stratum would then have to either, by way of the VTA and the dopamine cells, affect mm -hmm. hippocampus, or via the back loop, via the thalamus, affect prefrontal cortex and mm -hmm. hippocampus, Great which options. is a, is a longer cool, loop. Right? It's interesting, because it means if you're not able to nail a cross-correlation with, with a lag of about 25 milliseconds, <laughs> then it might be need some global, non-specific attentional signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it's more a methodological thing that this method doesn't allow to pinpoint sure. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I understand. In a, in a previous study on, on replay, we did find that the hippocampus actually leads the accumbens by uh, the expected okay. amounts, of, yeah, 50 milliseconds and longer. Uh, but here, yeah, I sort of try to make the point that on the one hand, there's division of labor with the hippocampus doing its place things, its place cells, 
in the Cummins knot. It's where the, the, the action sequence, which is parsed and coded. But there's also this overriding importance of uh, the queue appearing, affecting multiple modules coherently, at least, uh, close in time. Um, so let's then look at uh, uh, more mechanisms of communication, because this coordination doesn't say per se how uh, the combination is being done. And for this, we also turn to, to oscillations. Uh, I don't know how this picture came up. It just came up in, in Google when I searched for robotic architectures. Um, so that's what you get, especially the lubrication oil is interesting over here. Uh, anyway, we, we go to um, mechanisms of oscillations, looking at a different uh, system. Uh, we're now more going to look at the sensory cortices, talking to hippocampus and perirhinal cortex as a, as a structure for classification uh, and object recognition. Uh, one way to look at oscillations is that uh, when you have an oscillating brain structure that is oscillating in the fields, looking at mass synaptic potentials that um, uh, cohere together, and alternation of excitation and inhibition cycles. Um, but they will also lead to spike synchronization to some extent. And if you have spike synchronization, it will be easier to get uh, temporal summation at a target uh, cell, like over here. Temporal summation of the EPSPs, which then uh, facilitate uh, spiking. So this kind of feed forward uh, coincident mechanism can exist. Uh, oscillations will also impact on, on plasticity, uh, very likely. Um, this is also seen as, as having strong presynaptic synchrony. Um, here's just one cell projecting to the other. If the postsynaptic cell generates enough depolarization, uh, but we have big EPSPs also on the basis of presynaptic synchronization, it's easier to get spike timing dependent plasticity in this order you would get LTP. In some other order, you might get LTT. So um, this is an obvious possible consequence at least for uh, of synchronization. Uh, indeed, uh, Gilles Laurent has, has evidence that this works in uh, the locust nervous system. Um, then the, the, the school of basically Wolf Singer, uh, but also Pascal Fries have proposed first that oscillations could be useful for binding of different features that are coded in different brain areas. Uh, Pascal now generalizes the story more to, towards flexibil flexibility in communication. That is, uh, oscillations can, can be useful in uh, communication between brain areas. Uh, for instance, if two brain areas have, have a so-called good phase relationship, uh, they are able to excite each other basically in a, in a way because uh, these cells will project to the other area. Uh, they arrive, uh, the spikes arrive at a phase of the oscillation where there's little inhibition, and so the spikes can effectively drive excitation in the other area. Whereas another third area might be not effectively driven because it's out of phase. It has a sort of bad phase relationship and the spikes end up in the inhibition. Uh, this is a very useful framework. It can be um, <clears throat> also applied over here. Uh, of course, you do suppose a mechanism for regulating this phase shifting. Um, is it, but do you look at it in the same way as static gamma coding of John Disman? Uh, no, this is a, uh, at this stage about one rhythm. So ma mainly gamma rhythm that okay, I also okay. talk about. Uh, theta gamma is very interesting, the phase amplitude coupling that you have of theta and gamma. Uh, Lisman proposed, I think with Ole Jensen, also the idea of sequencing, of, of laying out a sequence of uh, experiences being coded in spike trains uh, in which the gamma provides the fine time resolution and right. uh, they're subsumed in a bigger theta cycle, which is also useful for storage, for temporal compression, and uh, uh, this is seen in uh, phase precession. Uh, so that's an additional mechanism. Um, just uh, as a final point, I'd like to add that phasing could also be used as a different coding mode uh, in addition to firing rates. We propose, for instance, more in the context of multimodal integration, uh, that whereas you need firing rates probably for, for coding of features, uh, the relationships between features uh, could be coded more by the, by the phases, about how cells affect each other's uh, phase. Um, so there's all different ideas and could be equally valid, but must be tested further. And we're going to do so in, in this system of four brain areas uh, to begin with. Uh, they're all part of this sensory to hippocampal hierarchy. Um, and now we are, we're going to make tetrad recordings in each of these areas. Um, questions for today, because you can do many things with this, is, that there, is there actually a gamma oscillation in 
uh, the areas, but especially the barrel cortex, uh, where whisking information, some of the sensory information is processed. There's been a bit of a debate there whether gamma is actually present, but most of the previous studies have been done in head-fixed animals. Um, we're going to look at freely moving, task-performing animals. And is there also a gamma rhythm across areas? So is there coherence of the gamma rhythm across these areas, perirhinal hippocampus? So it could be the gamma rhythm a, a mode for, for a large range, a long range uh, synchronization. And Martin Fink and Jeroen Bolson Lab uh, devised this task, which I labeled follow the money task. It's, it, it's a task where the rat has to walk across this figure eight maze. Um, in this middle lane, uh, the rat has to stop and wait for visual stimuli to appear, diamond pattern, airplane pattern. And then one of them will be the CS plus, always. Um, if the CS plus would be the airplane, for instance, uh, then the rat would have to go towards the uh, right after a delay. Um, but if the airplane appears on the left, it would have to go left. So it always has to follow that money stimulus, so to speak. And um, uh, additionally, there are tactile stimuli over here, sandpaper cues on the walls that would indicate the expected reward amount. So the reward will be given here if the rat returns uh, to this arm, to the middle lane, and um, that's, that's how the uh, reward amount can be predicted. Uh, so let's see what happens um, in this uh, video. Uh, we have a demonstration of uh, how it is going in a rat that is being recorded. This is the, um, the cable over here. Rats are quite fast. This is actually real time. Rat makes its return to the middle lane, gets a small reward just to keep him on the spot over there. Uh, there there's a manual operation of the barriers, etc. So there's some human interference. But it's fairly stereotyped. Stimuli appear again. Rat makes a mistake. The diamonds are the CS minus, but he turns around uh, before he actually passes the point of no return. And he's allowed to do that, so he still gets a reward in this case. Barriers are back in place, and there's a delay interval. Now the CS plus, the airplane, appears on the right, and now he really makes a mistake. It doesn't get any reward. Too bad. So you get lots of different trials going right, correct, going. Uh, right, wrong, left, correct, etc. These are all the events that are being registered by photo beams, like uh, when he passes a particular point of no return, etc. In his task, <clears throat> um, actually, yeah, the, the rats are well not the greatest visual animals, but they are well able to learn this across uh, several weeks to, to months. The real challenge is in the uh, recordings. So to to do these four area ensemble recordings with. Uh, lots of cells in every area is, is quite difficult. So usually you, you have great cells in one area and then really have to look for the next area to come up. Uh, but eventually this, this works. We have uh, some sensory barrel cortex recordings, uh, CA1 recordings, primary visual cortex recordings, and perirhinal recordings. Uh, in terms of the anatomy, the somatosensory cortex and primary visual converge on the perirhinal. This is where we have multisensory integration as well as object recognition, object formation, and hippocampal area C1 is, of course, known. Um, the uh, device is called a quad drive. It has these uh, distinct uh, uh, tetrode bundles, four coming out of the exit grid. And one is really tilted because the perirhinal cortex is quite deep, and it's also hidden under a ridge of the skull. So you have to make this kind of approach from the middle going uh, lateral uh, down. It's quite um, a challenge to, to reach. Uh, now for the uh, analysis of uh, uh, synchrony, um, Martin Fink developed a new measure with us called the WPLI. It's a weighted face locking index. Uh, basically the problem in uh, synchronization of fields is uh, that you have a lot of volume conduction, but also a lot of noise, um, additional mixture, so you record from two different tetrodes, but you actually are recording the same source, and it's, uh, it's signaled on both uh, electrodes. Um, so what we try to do is actually to attach more weight in the computation of the coherence by not so much looking at uh, zero phase differences between signals, because they can be volume conducted, but at looking uh, at, at signals with out of phase differences. Uh, that is not 180 degrees difference, because here you might have a dipole configuration with a reversal of um, of the signal, positive to negative, like in the hippocampus actually occurs. Um, but we're on this unitary circle, uh, 
attaching more weight if uh, the phase difference falls along this imaginary axis, not the real axis, which is 0 to 180 degrees. Uh, and if you do that, you get a, a big uh, cleanup of your signal because volume conduction is actually a big problem, even uh, if you look at, for instance, hippocampus to neocortex uh, communication. Uh, but this uh, works. You can now, for instance, look at the coherence of the fields within a somatosensory cortex, the barrel cortex. Um, as a function of frequency, you get this the biased uh, WPLI measure, which is the uh, sort of uh, volume corrected uh, measure of the coherence. Um, it's quite strong in the 60 hertz range, and it's stronger during the movement period. So as the rat is still waiting for the visual stimulus to come, there's some gamma, but it gets stronger once he uh, goes into the, the lanes and makes a choice, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of coherence with other areas, uh, the gamma is not doing so well. For instance, here we compare the fields of barrel with pyrirhinal, and these are the same scales. So the inset is a, is a real zoom in, uh, but the scale here runs up to 0.5 in this WPLI measure, and it's almost zero. Same here with CA1, and uh, visual cortex is also really weak. The inset shows a little bit of gamma coherence, maybe, but that's... Uh, and this would be true at any phase relationship, with, given your measure, or still for a subset, or biased towards... Bias towards um, uh, non-zero or 180 degrees <coughs> differences. Well, it's, yeah, because it's... Because the point is, uh, it might now also be an artifact of your measure, right? Because maybe you have smeared it out, for instance, right? So, so maybe you have opposing phase relationships at, at different angles, mm -hmm. and then by lumping them all together, you, you get rid of them again. Uh, yeah, but it's already a lot better than having no uh, valuation of the phase difference as influencing your measure. So in other words, the, the old coherence measures no, wait, take the uh, zero and 180 degrees equally into account. Uh, of course. But there's you control it. Have you, for instance, done, done, done an additional analysis only look at very specific phase relationships? Um, well, not experimentally, but in, in simulations, we, ha we have done that. Yeah, yeah, lots of it. And yeah, then you get the yeah. same thing, the same outcome. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you also find, uh, for instance, situations where you expect hippocampal volume conduction, yeah. which is very strong in the theta range, mm -hmm. to disappear, for instance, in the orbital frontal cortex. You can do that. If you compute the uh, coherence then locally amongst the electrodes in the orbital frontal cortex, without the uh, WPLI correction, you do find theta coherence. Mm -hmm. But with it, it disappears, and it's very likely to be uh, volume conduction. Okay. So, uh, um, right, so at the level of fields, we're not talking about spikes yet. Um, there's this gamma coherence, but only locally, uh, just to control. Within each other area, you do find often gamma coherence, such as pyrrhinal, the, the electrodes within the pyrrhinal, which are also eight, um, have mutual uh, coherence, even uh, with these uh, phase delays in them. Also CA1 as expected and visual cortex as expected, not equally strong. Um, so it does appear to be the case that there is uh, gamma synchronization amongst the LFPs, but for the moment locally in uh, somatosensory cortex area one, some depends on behavior. Uh, other areas have also local gamma, but it's not very strong across areas. So for a moment we have to say it's got a local uh, function. Um, then uh, Martin and Jeroen looked at different cell types uh, because now we have also the spikes coming into the story. Uh, the main distinction is indeed between narrow spikers, that is, this is a time scale of one millisecond, it's the time scale of, of spiking. Uh, the action potential amplitude is plotted over here. Uh, especially this repolarization phase differs a lot and there's a dichotomy between uh, fast spikers or narrow spikers which are mainly interneurons and broad spikers, mainly pyramidal cells, which are the blue guys. Uh, these broad spikers fall into two classes, the irregular ones, that is the bursty uh, spike patterns occur. First, the regular ones, these are the ones going pop, 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 with long intervals. This is actually a peak shown here of the interspike interval histogram. So it shows uh, long intervals on average uh, versus uh, bursty uh, short intervals. Um, and if we now compute the uh, coherence of the spikes with the field potential, uh, we can establish whether indeed these LFPs have, have local relevance, because 
we haven't shown that actually so far. The LFPs, even though different phases might still be impinging from different areas. Uh, but there is, like over here, a, a coherence of the spikes with gamma rhythm. This is actually an orbital frontal example with the spikes aligning more or less to the peak of the oscillation. Uh, but similarly, in a PPC measure of uh, Martin Fink, uh, we also find um, for the narrow spikers, uh, strong gamma coherence around 60 hertz, this, this big peak. The broad spikers, a bit less, but mainly in the theta range, uh, merging into beta and gamma. Uh, so again, uh, it's a confirmation that gamma is local. There's entrainment of the, the cortical cells to gamma, so that's a relevant observation. Um, if you look at the barrel spikes now to other areas again, it could be that they are entrained by some perirhinal input. Uh, again, you don't find that. So the PPC is very low, this, this phase locking measure, as opposed to S1 itself. Also, almost no phase locking to CA1 and uh, V1 uh, rhythms, whereas those spikes in those areas uh, are coherent with some kind of rhythm over there. So the, the perirhinal spikes have strong theta coherence to the local fields uh, recorded in the perirhinal, et cetera. Uh, so again, it, it's a story of, of, of being quite local, quite strong, but local. Um, uh, but now we have more certainty that the cells actually listen uh, to that uh, local rhythm. So surreal, there's this work by people like Tisinger, right, who claim that this, this gamma oscillations in the cortex are mainly due to interneurons. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So is, is, do you also feel that confirmed in, in your data? Okay, well, let's have a look at the next slide again. Oh, no, I'm psychic. <laughs> See, I tell you. Yeah, no, you, you are. Yeah, it's predictive coding What's going on here. So again, we have the different groups of uh, neurons. Um, fast spikers, which are interneurons or narrow spikers. And then the broad uh, spikers, which are mainly pyramidal cells. Uh, but indeed, the interneurons, uh, so the red ones, fall into two classes. And this is where, indeed, ing and ping mechanisms uh, come around the corner. Um, what you see, if you plot the, the phasing of the spikes with respect to the gamma, is that there is one subgroup of interneurons which locks early to the gamma cycle, and one group uh, later. So these are the narrow spikers with two subgroups. Um, and these are the, the broad spikers, which are mainly pyramidal cells. You see that the early group is spiking before the pyramidal cells, which contradicts a so-called ping mechanism. Ping would be pyramidal interneuron network gamma mechanism. That is indeed tisinga uh type of network. This is basically recurrent inhibition. So you first excite your pyramidal cell, which then activates the interneuron, and then you go to the next uh, cycle of excitation. So the, the late spikers are compatible with ping, but not the early ones, because they are interneurons that fire before the pyramidal cells. And that would be consistent with an ing mechanism, which is interneuron network gamma. The spiking here would be caused by a basal excitation of the interneurons, which lock to each other by way of synaptic connections and or uh, gap junctions. So it may also be described. So there's uh, evidence in our data actually supportive of both mechanisms that, that we have a mixture over here. Uh, and then the, the, early, um, uh, the early interneurons have a somewhat higher pr preference for higher gamma uh, frequencies than the, than the late uh, spikers. Um, then, yeah, as, turn, as concerns the function of the gamma rhythm, um, uh, we know that there's behavioral modulation, but not yet, a, let's say, a detailed coupling to whisking movements, which haven't been measured here, actually. Uh, but we do see that... Um, if you compute the correlation, the spearman rank correlation, for instance, between uh, the excitability, so the firing rates of the cells achieved, uh, as opposed to the, um, uh, the strength of synchronization across different frequencies, you find for gamma generally a, a positive relationship. So in, in this case, gamma has a more or less stimulating function. There's, it's coupling to enhanced firing, at least, of the pyramidal cells, the broad spikers. Whereas there's negative correlations also in the beta and theta ranges. So they behave differently. The, the theta and beta are quite a different story. There's different coherences between areas, especially perirhinal hippocampus are very strong in the theta domain, but we um, are not quite ready with the analyses. Uh, then finally, um, uh, something more about hippocampal coding, how versatile it is. Um, and so we again turn to, uh, to place and time, but we also have to ask, well, what are actually the key functions of the hippocampus? 
Uh, of course, a key lead came from the lesion studies where we saw how episodic memory and declarative memory is impaired. There's the where, the when, and the what. Uh, I think H4W also had the how, but it's presumably not hippocampal so much. Um, the other lead then comes from our play cells, which you've seen before, right? These are not quite compatible schemes, but you could argue, as has been done extensively, that the hippocampus contributes to episodic memory by way of its spatial aspects. Um, but then, if you ask, is, is spatial coding actually the only principle by which the hippocampus contributes to declarative or episodic memory? Uh, we're starting to think, well, probably not. Despite some hardliners in the fields, there's strong evidence that also temporal aspects are being coded, that when you lesion the hippocampus, aspects of temporal sequencing are impaired, as shown in the work of Eichenbaum. Uh, Pastelkova and Buzaki had evidence for these episode cells uh, that are active at sequential moments when rats keep on wheel running. There's recent work by Eichenbaum on this issue of, of when coding. At least when time is important, the hippocampus will code it. Um, but all these studies have been limited to the rat's own position, uh, either in time and space. And it's a fundamental aspect of episodic memory also to look at whether all this information pertains to yourself or to others. Uh, so this is where um, our collaboration also with Paul comes in and, and others, John Lismond. So is the hippocampus actually also coding non-self representations? Uh, that is about other agents. And so we devised this sort of hybrid rat robot experiment. Um, originally, Armin Duff came over to the lab in Amsterdam and showed us how to use uh, the EPUCs over here, the Breitenberg uh, vehicles. And uh, we made a task actually where, for instance, the rat has to uh, observe uh, the robot behavior from a cage and uh, make behavioral decisions. So the rat really has to pay attention where this robot is, is going. There's a small video fragment of this task. Actually, what you see first is how the rat is now exploring the maze itself. It contains multiple arms the central arm, these front arms in front of the observation cage, and these middle arms which sort of go away from the rat's perspective if the rat is sitting here. And you see the headlights. This is also used for the video tracking of the rat's head position. And these, these numbers flashing are again events like beams being crossed. So we now flip to a next fragment where the rat is actually um, um, has learned to, to pass into the observation cage. So a plexiglass door is being lowered, and the rat can enter into the observation compartment. Um, and then the next moment is when the robot is placed onto the maze, as over here. And now from remote control, uh, Bluetooth with a laptop, you can control this, this robot movement. And the rat has to basically observe uh, where this robot is going and make a behavioral decision. So in the observation cage are reward wells, there's a left and right choice right next to each other. Uh, and basically this rat has to make uh, decisions based on where the robot is. The robot is now resuming start position again. And what you see is, is again what we call the, the front task. So either moving towards the left, right in front of the observation cage. Uh, the alternative version is when the robot moves into these middle arms. So away from the rat but leftward or away from the rat rightward into this lane. But there's also free roaming behavior of the robot, where the rat doesn't basically have to do anything. Um, and then there's uh, this, this exploration phase of the rat itself on uh, the maze. Um, so the task design basically falls apart into different components or questions. There's the phase where the rat performs this robot task either robot moving in front or through these middle lanes. Uh, there's an observation phase where the rat basically doesn't have to do anything while the robot is still uh, there, it's still moving around. Or the robot is just absent and the rat is still in the observation cage and then there's the exploration of the rat on the, on the maze. For some behavioral data, the, the rats are able to discriminate robot behavior above chance level. This is the percentage correct responses for the front and the mid task. Uh, so the front task is slightly easier, gives some higher scores. Whereas the mid task is, is still significantly above chance level. So this shows that indeed 
uh, the rats learn to care about this uh, robot. How long, how, how long did it take the rats to learn the task? Uh, a couple of weeks, yeah. Okay. Was it longer it than usual or, or comparable? Uh, it, it's not an exceptionally difficult task, okay. no. So there's no, this that's interesting, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's the exploration phase, which is easy. Then they have to learn to pass into the observation cage themselves. Uh, the actual discrimination takes a couple of weeks. So they, but they are, they're first instructed that there is a reward well. They have to learn to obtain fluid at this place. And then they learn to mind about the robot. Uh, so they, they're gradually brought into the discrimination task. Um, okay, the, the exact uh, measures are not that important, except to say that the rat learns to care about the robot. Um, and then you have to do all this behavioral tracking of both the, the robot as it moves about uh, and the rat itself. So these black trajectories are where the rat has been moving. This is where the robot has been moving. And the key thing is actually to plot the spikes as a function of either the rat position or the robot position now. So you can actually look whether the rat hippocampus codes uh, a place field, but for the robot, uh, and not only for the rat, for instance. So a place field for the rat is uh, expected. Um, and so this is a, a control um, measurement, you could say. This is where uh, the rat is roaming about in the maze itself, chasing food pallets, and these are just six examples of, of regular place fields, as you might expect them. Um, but that's, that's by all means expected, so not very interesting. A uh, different question is whether you have mirror place neurons in the rat hippocampus, analogous to the uh, uh, mirror neurons in the premotor cortex. You might maybe expect that when the rat has a place field for itself, it might also have a place field for the robot being at the same position uh, in that maze, as if uh, the rat would project himself to be at that position when the robot is there or something like that. So it could be in a, in a way comparable to the mirror neurons that code for common actions either by a monkey or somebody else doing the same action. Uh, but we don't find this. We, we recorded about 900 cells. And here you have the cells um, with firing rates plotted as a function of the rat position. The two examples. Uh, and here the same, but now plotted as a function of robot position while the rat is in the observation cage. And, and the pattern is quite dispersed. We found one instance of a cell that had a common place field for when the rat was roaming itself versus the observation phase. Uh, but when the guys checked the videos, actually the rat had been jumping over the fence and had been roaming on the maze. <laughs> That's a sneaky action <laughs> that uh, gave us hope on mirror play cells, but uh, no, uh, not there. But um, you can ask, uh, for instance, does it matter whether the robot is present at all? Uh, does it matter for hippocampal coding? So here you have the rate map again for the rat position, now being confined to the observation cage. And we're looking at the commonly occupied positions with the robot present or not. Uh, there's a difference here. You can see how for this cell, uh, the cell doesn't care very much where the robot is. Uh, but at least when the robot is not there, there's almost no firing. So at least there's a strong rate modulation and you can um, basically calculate the statistics by pooling snippets of time shuffle them across the contrasted conditions, robots present or not, and then establish that uh, quite a bit of cells are above the 2.5% level, either going up or going down in the absence of the robot. So there's coding uh, or enhanced firing for both uh, conditions. Uh, we then ask, does it matter whether the rat engages in a task? Um, this is, again, a relevant distinction. So now we combine the front and the mid task together, as over here. Uh, and here, the robot was just freely roaming about with the rat performing no particular uh, task, earning no rewards. Uh, you do find, again, a, a difference. You see a play cell here in the observation cage with a rate, rate modulation. And here it's interesting to see that there is a commonality of the robot being in the, this central portion. Also here, but the firing rate is much stronger when there is a task going on. And again, a, a subset of the cells make this uh, distinction. Uh, but so far, of course, you have also different motivational states. In one case, you could say, well, the, the rat is highly motivated, and already this change in attention or motivation could uh, explain this difference. So it doesn't yet say that there is a specific coding of uh, the robot's behavior in the sense that this behavior could vary, and it would have to be coded uh, differently also. 
Uh, but here then the, um, the two different tasks of the robot are becoming important. This is a cell that uh, distinguishes between the, the, the mid task, where the robot has a different behavioral pattern than the front task. Uh, the cell is actually more active in the front condition, but there are also quite a lot of cells the other way around, more active in the, uh, the middle uh, task condition. And now, well, the, the behaviors are quite the same because there's, there's this behavioral left-right distinction to make, but that's identical in both conditions. And the rat is quite equally motivated. Uh, one can argue that uh, you could say, well, the behavioral and motivational conditions are very nearly identical. There's a few controls to be done here, like on head direction and how the animal is exactly oriented in the cage, but that's uh, what we're working on right now. So uh, to, to wrap it up, um, to take away, uh, well, this is to take away the tapas, but also to go to the uh, to lunch. Um, the key points, I think, are that there's both fine-grained coding in line with division between, division of labor between modules, so place coding uh, in the hippocampus, uh, motivated action coding in the striatum, for instance, but then there are overriding events uh, that are so important that they impinge on uh, multiple modules at the same time. So it's, it's not the case that the hippocampus doesn't care about uh, cues that have great behavioral significance, for instance. In terms of com communication, we looked at gamma rhythms, but uh, probably another time I could talk about theta and beta rhythms. Uh, but they appear here to be locally involved. It's local computation, maybe in the way of normalization, maybe in the way of phase coding, maybe also coherence between different barrels, but not certainly brain-wide. So it is a, a different story than um, uh, told by people from the Singer School, but uh, they have also looked, for instance, Conrado Bosman, who's working in the lab, at communication in the gamma and beta range within the visual cortex system. So that's mainly V1 to V4. And in terms of scaling of brain systems, we're looking at a more long-range system going from hippocampus all the way to sensory cortex. Uh, and then the last point is this versatility of hippocampal coding uh, possibly explaining its wider role in episodic memory. And, um, well, this slide by Dale Lee shows also the overall impact of reward on the human brain as measured by fMRI. And, well, here are some of the people involved in the work. Uh, Karine and Jaden, very much important for the hippocampal straight of story. Laura Donga, very uh, valuable and experienced technician. Uh, Jan Lankelma in the software engineering. This guy you know, this is John Lisman, and Jeroen Bos and Martin Fink, uh, involved in the later parts. And here's Ivana, also working on the Goal Leaders project that uh, will be discussed this afternoon. So thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you, Cyril, that's really great. Questions? Armin. This is the last part where you looked at the robot data. Um, you said you would not find a mirror cell, but would you find at all localized activity for the position? Of the robot? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that appears to be there. That is, if we, we chunk, um, let's say, the left portion from the central and the right portion, let's say, within the front task, um, and there do seem to be uh, uh, rate modulations, at, at least. Um, we, we do have to make a couple of controls there to make sure that it's it's, it's the robot position that matters there. Yeah. Can you afford yeah. to use uh, another uh, um, mouse to, to be observed instead of a robot? Because here you may lose the mechanisms of identification of the mouse with the, the other one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, instead of having a robot to be observed, yeah. if you had a, a conspecific, yeah. maybe yeah. you can yeah. see mirror neurons that you don't, don't see here. It right. depends on. It's sort of more uh, self-identification with the other agents, yeah. Uh, that could we consider that approach of using constant it's more difficult for sure. The yeah. first approach for me. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, these are rats, by the way. But rats, uh, they're, they're kind of all rodents. Um, yeah, the, the reason to choose for the robot uh, was actually that you can so much control the behavior of the robot. No, I understand, but maybe the second step because you can find mirror neurons could be now. Uh, yeah, again for yeah. mirror neurons. Yeah. With, uh, yeah, no, we, we don't prove that the hippocampus could never generate mirror behavior. Uh, there's one study by uh, Moritz von Heimendahl and Brecht where they actually use different conspecifics and test whether the rat can identify them. 
and also whether Campbell cells make a difference. But they, they have very weak distinctions. Um, yeah, but, uh, but Cyril, I, yeah. I think from our perspective, we wanted to use the robot exactly because it was so dissimilar, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. no, no, I yeah. think this, yeah. this should be the first step. But yeah. now that you have a negative result about the neuron, yours maybe you should uh, think about us about using Yeah, methods. yeah. Well, I t yeah. yeah, the hippocampus well, is not a good target for mirror neurons. Uh, no, it was no, a wild guess. Because you, this is that might be interested there. in this yeah. aspect, maybe. Yeah. No, 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 it was not, uh, let's say, the specific target hypothesis to look for mirror neurons. But it, they could have been accidentally there uh, yeah, yeah. without any prior prediction. So I agree that, yeah, I think it's interesting to look at all kinds of agents, including artificial ones, and see whether rats learn to care about them. Uh, but, but surely they might, uh, especially if you make rats interact and they get to know each other and maybe transmit a food preference or so, they uh, evolve into a more uh, intimate relationship. Or to have a rat more familiar with the robot. To have, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> sharing a space for some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we did some preliminary well, experiments, and the rats don't like them very much. They chew on the robots <laughs> quite a bit. Okay? Yeah. So we built all sort of protective armor for the, for the robots. <laughs> yeah. the rats, is the rats are strong enough to throw them uh, upside down, and then the robot is just wheeling around and. Uh, I'm doing great. Should have shown that video. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. have a question? Does the yeah. rat learn anything from the behavior of the robot? Like if he doesn't know the mate, and if show you, he show to the rat the robot moving there, does he learn any anything about the structure of the mate of the environment? The mate being a companion rat. No, no, the mate. Oh, the mate. Ah. Uh, well, we didn't test if the robot first moves across the maze, whether the rat could more easily move across that maze. And usually the, the order was that the rat first gets a okay, chance so the robot before the maze. Okay, yeah. the before and then to observe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is done across multiple sessions, so the rats are generally familiar with the maze, mm -hmm. uh, even before the robot enters. But they, they do show gradual improvement of discrimination behavior. That's, that's certainly the case. So they first usually pick up the, the front task, and then as the robot has a different behavior, they, they also pick that up. Yeah. So that's real on the gamma coding story. Uh -huh. um, now, Bill Newsom and others have reported on sort of gamma being like a preferential channel for long-range communication in the macaque brain. Right, it was the frontal eye fields and, what was it? Yeah. Some visual areas, MT. Mm -hmm. so, why, I mean, what's the discrepancy here? Because for your data seems to be pretty conclusive in the sense mm -hmm. as a local local organizer for something. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. the discrepancy here? Um, one is technical, that you do have to control for volume conduction. Can we also so you're saying they did it? Um, I'm not saying that <laughs> explains their results per se, but uh, it's a confine. It's, okay. it's, it's also... Um, a confine to find strong spike coherence if you don't have enough spikes and you don't correct for the number of spikes. Okay, so a statistical artifact then? Well, could be. I yeah. would have to look into the data. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you have okay. one spike with lots of oscillations, you will have great face locking. <laughs> because the, the, the vector is <laughs> unitary. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Right, and if okay. you uh, add multiple spikes, it will mm -hmm. generally not result in a zero mm -hmm. vector. But with, okay. uh, with our method, you do. Um, but there, there could also be systems differences. It could be that attention has a special dependence on gamma, which you do see back at the long range of communication, mm -hmm. uh, whereas maybe in our task that attentional requirement is not so strong. So we're not excluding that gamma could play into the long range mm -hmm. under some conditions. No, so but the question is indeed what's, what's the next step now, because in, in principle, of course, it's a critical question also for the, the preparation you have, right? But you look at multiple areas, so of course you want to know how they exchange information. Mm -hmm. So uh, would, you bet, would your bet be like, okay, maybe we should look at a different frequency range, get away from gamma, um, what? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, the preliminary data of the same task already suggested beta is much more long range. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't exactly figured out the significances yet. And Theta seems to be more important in the hippocampal NTL system. Mm -hmm. So uh, hippocampus and pyrrhinal are very close in terms of theta coherence, like they are also with the entorhinal cortex. So that, that seems to be more of a, a, a local mm -hmm. collaborative system. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's also 
previous data on theta, for instance, cohering in the cingulate with the hippocampus. Our barrel cortex has been studied by Sirota and Buzaki. Um, and they, I think, correctly excluded this as a volume conduction artifact. Mm -hmm. So theta coherence between hippocampus and neocortex should be really regarded with suspicion. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that means you're not giving up on that yet? No, no, no. no. In, okay. uh, in contrary, we, we, we would emphasize now for the future more beta mm -hmm. and other... Uh, but now, the other thing, also with the schemes that you proposed, even though you forgot to mention the temporal population code, which is way more interesting, yeah. because most of these schemes are pretty non-specific. Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't tell you anything really about coding or what is exchange, but that's a very, a very, let's say, coarse way to think about how you might establish communication, like a carrier wave or something. Yeah. It's yeah. not really very specific about the information exchange and so on. Right. right. Yeah. So yeah. now your results that sort of say, well, look, gamma might not do the trick. Does it imply that you have now invalidated the number of these schemes that you took as your examples? Like the Pascal Free Scheme, for instance, or...? Uh, the Free Scheme could still work, I think, locally in the visual system, as, as they argue, mm -hmm. uh, but not under all conditions for, for our, our mm -hmm. kind of... So I mean, in the context system. of behavior and, sing and bringing together multiple areas in the brain that serve action, it might yeah, not generalize. Yeah. No, it's not gamma. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then do you I, see this as... Uh, under these tasks? No, of course, no, I understand. Where, you know, yeah, I know, you have to be polite attention. and make all these reservations. <laughs> I understand, that's fine. Oh, oh, uh, this claim. But then the other thing yeah. is, on the one hand, you can think about cortical cortical interactions or cortical thalamic. Mm -hmm. Right, so how do, how do you split that out? So do you see this really as a cortical cortical or hippoc hippocampal cortical direct pathways communication? Or do you also see the thalamus really as an, a key hub figuring in this game? It probably, probably is, yeah. Uh, we can't really tell from these data for which rhythms the thalamus here would be crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, it's known to be crucial for, for alpha rhythms, um, uh, probably other frequencies as well. No, because you're not measuring from it, right? You're not no, 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 right? no, no. no. So right. yeah. should, should you be doing that, actually? In the end, we have to measure everything. Yeah, even <laughs> okay. within your brain, we have to measure all areas. <laughs> well, it might not be easy. I have, I have three neurons left. That's an easy task. Good. Okay. So we have other questions yeah, for Cyril. Yeah. And if not, Cyril, thank you very much. Great job.